from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African Middle East Reading Room. We're delighted to have you all uh, attend this wonderful program with Halle Butvin, One Mango Tree. Uh, this year, as many of you know, and as our big poster <laughs> um, uh, shows, we are, we in the African Middle East Division, uh, by the way, I'm Mary Jane Deeb, I'm the chief of the division, and we're all celebrating the 50th anniversary of the African section. This division has three sections, the Hebraic section, the Near East section, and the African section. And this year is the 50th anniversary of the African section. Uh, it's a very special year, and we've had programs throughout the year, including a big display, films, um, uh, lectures, uh, and numerous programs throughout the year in celebration of this 50th anniversary. And uh, Halle Budwin is part of the celebration uh, that we're having this year. Um, we are uh, a small division, about 20 people, and in that small division we have uh, the African section is made up of four, uh, four specialists. Uh, each is a reference uh, person, is a recommending officer, is a selecting officer, and is a scholar in her own right. Uh, each person has traveled far and wide on the continent of Africa knows the customs, knows the history, and each is a resource for um, people doing research on Africa. So I'm very, very proud not only of our collections, African collections, which are some of the best in the world, in the entire world, but I'm very proud also of each specialist who has done so much to make and to enhance this collection and each also has reached out in uh, the community, both in the Washington area, in the national community, and the international community, to bring speakers uh, of the caliber of Halle Batvin today uh, to uh, enrich our uh, discussion, our resources, our materials, with their own research and their own work so I'm delighted to welcome to the library and to our uh, division, Halle Batvin. Eve Ferguson, our youngest member, and who joined the library three years ago, um, is going to introduce the speaker. And um, again, Eve herself is a specialist who has worked on, has been a journalist, a university professor, a writer and speaks Swahili and, uh, and is a new addition to our division. And Eve is going to introduce Halle. Eve? Sorry. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I have to first say that this program is being recorded for future webcast on loc.gov and the AMED webpage. Um, my name is Eve Ferguson, reference librarian for East Africa, and welcome to the African Middle Eastern Division Reading Room. Uh, as Mary Jane said, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the African section, and it's been a very good year for the African section, so I'd like to recognize my colleagues at this time, two of them who aren't here, but I see that one, Dr. Angel Batiste is here. She had a great program yesterday on, uh, on Obama and Ghana. Um, and during this pivotal year, of course, 17 African nations gained their independence, and two members of this division with close ties to East Africa also achieved half a century. Um, they know who I'm talking about. 
Uh, in honor of this anniversary, I'm concluding my pro programming year. This is my fifth program for the year. And it's truly special because it successfully combines two of my favorite things. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I have a special love for the East African country of Uganda. And it's not just because I spent three beautiful years of my childhood there, but because Uganda is a truly beautiful country. In fact, when Europeans first came to Uganda, they thought it was the Garden of Eden. Um, I'm not sure that it's not. Um, earlier this year, I had the pleasure of returning to Uganda on behalf of the World Digital Library, and I believe it's even more wonderful than it was when I was nine years old. So that's one of my favorite things. A few months back, my friend and colleague here at the library, who's sitting here but I won't out her, um, <laughs> posted something on her Facebook page about a one mango tree sale. I had no idea what it was, but anything named after a mango must be good. So lo and behold, it was an opportunity to shop. And that's another one of my favorite things. And it was products from Uganda. Um, could this world be any more perfect? I don't think so. When I discovered one mango tree, I immediately wrote to the founder, our speaker today, and asked her to come to the library. And it's our good fortune that she returned to the United States this fall and is here to tell us about one mango tree. It's one of my favorite websites, and I know it'll be one of yours. Um, not just because of the good stuff on it, but because of the good that it does for Uganda. Our speaker today is Holly Butfin, founder of One Mango Tree. She's originally from a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, and Holly did her, both her undergrad, a BA in Spanish International Studies, and Master's in City and Regional Planning at Ohio State, and then moved to DC to try to get a job in international development, um, finding it was not so quite so easy to break into the industry. She was guided to use her vacation time exploring work in developing countries. A friend pointed her in the direction of Uganda, and when she started researching the conflict in northern Uganda, she was horrified to find out how little she actually knew um, and understood about African issues. The initial research prompted Butvin to take the advice. She traveled to Uganda in 2006 on a three-week study trip on the role of youth in conflict resolution. It was this trip that planted the first seeds of one mango tree when she met women from northern Uganda who were making paper bead necklaces in slums in Kampala. She quit her regular day job in finance and contracts and moved to Uganda in early 2009 to pursue one mango tree full time and now splits her time between DC, Ohio and Uganda. Butvin also does uh, some consulting work for US aid projects. She spent much of 2010 guiding women-owned businesses in Pakistan to develop their products and business for export to U.S. and European markets. In her free time, she loves to practice yoga. She's a certified yoga teacher. We'll have to get her back on that. <laughs> and reads voraciously. I mean, what could be better for a library? Um, she also loves riding her bike, which is not something you get to do in Uganda. No, the traffic would mow you down. Um, so she's really enjoying that part of being back in D.C., and we're lucky that she's back in D.C. at this time. So please welcome Ms. Holly Butfin. I have to say thanks to Eve. I was so excited and honored when she sent me an email. The Library of Congress, I was like, I've really made it. I cannot believe this. So I was so special to come up and walk up those steps today and come inside. It's really an honor to be here. I wanted to talk to you about One Mango Tree, but I want to make sure that I leave time for you to ask questions. And what I thought I would do is kind of explain the business model from a perspective that's really, really important to me and important to making the business a success, which is fair trade. And now today's, what, November 2nd, so we just missed all of October was fair trade month, and the theme was that every purchase matters. And so with One Mango Tree, I'm gonna go through the business model and the work that we do in Uganda through the lens of the nine principles of fair trade. So as Eve said, um, I took a little bit of a crazy step out of my conventional career. I was working in an in a office job in front of my computer every day and I really wanted to do international development work. And eventually that brought me to Northern Uganda and I was really interested in the causes of conflict. And I really wanted to understand 
what it was that causes communities to be in conflict and what they can do to actually get out of conflict but then remain out of conflict. And so I had a really unique opportunity to go to northern Uganda in 2006, which was actually before the ceasefire was signed. And I spent a lot of time there because I was doing these programs uh, which brought together youth from the United States and from Uganda to talk about conflict. I got to speak to Ugandans at all different levels of society, from ministers of parliament down to a woman living in an internally displaced camp. And so the question I asked everyone was, what do you think northern Uganda needs to achieve sustainable peace? And every person, with so few variations, said jobs. And so it really, you know, I had come there looking at this through the lens of development and thinking about all of these different programs and foreign aid and, you know, and I, I felt really overwhelmed. And so when I came back to Washington, I was trying to figure out what do I do? I, I suddenly felt thrown out of context, riding the metro and looking around in my apartment and everything that seemed important to me before didn't really seem that important anymore. So I thought, well, I don't know how much difference I'm going to make trying to work for a contractor doing development work, but I did meet some fabulous ladies in the market in Gulu, and they know how to sew. So let's see if maybe I can do a little something with them. So the picture that you see on the screen right now is Gulu's central marketplace. And during the conflict in northern Uganda, a lot of non-governmental organizations, NGOs, came in and provided training for women on tailoring. And this is one of those development projects that are very well intentioned, but are not market driven, and so therefore really aren't sustainable. And so what I found in Gulu, in northern Uganda, was that this market was just filled with tailors who'd had a few months of training. They could make these beautiful traditional dresses out of the African fabrics, which I instantly fell in love with, but they weren't making any money. They could barely carry the, the rent for their stall, which was about maybe $7 a month. They were really struggling and they weren't able to feed their families and they were doing the best that they could, but there was no market for their products. And so after that first trip, when I came home and I brought all these African fabrics and I could not believe the response I was getting at the prints and how much everybody really liked the fabrics. So I thought, here's an opportunity to link this group of individuals that have so little contact with the United States and understanding about what consumers might like, but here's a market for them. They all know how to sew. Let's see what we can put together. And so the woman in the bottom right corner is Auma Lucy, and she was the first tailor that I met in Gulu who just got it. She instantly got it. I'm not a designer at all, but we started drawing little sketches, and this was actually the bag we call the original, was the first bag I drew, a rectangle with a strap. It's very creative. <laughs> um, but it's one of our best sellers. Um, and, you know, and Lucy got it, and she did a really high-quality bag. And when I brought it back to the United States, everybody flipped out. So I thought, okay, here's the, you know, the first principle of fair trade is creating opportunity. So opening up that gateway, working with the women to help them develop a product that they could sell. I had about $500 in my savings account. So I got rid of all my clothes during that trip in Uganda, gave everything away, and I filled my suitcase, which you're not supposed to do. But I filled my suitcase with products and brought them back to the United States. I was living here in DC, I threw a party and sold absolutely everything. And I was able to get in touch with Lucy and say, we're in business. So the next step of the business that was really important to me too is connecting. I, I felt like as a shopper, just like Eve and probably many of you, I love to buy things. But until I took this trip to Uganda, I never really thought about the individual that's on the other end of what I'm buying. Whether I'm going to the mall or going you know, anywhere, picking up a gift, my preference was always to buy things that were cheap. I, you know, if I was getting a good deal, then I was really happy. But I started researching more about fair trade, and I realized that after making these connections with these women who were sewing for us, it meant so much more to me. And I realized that the people I was selling to, they wanted the story. They wanted the bag, but they also wanted to learn about this woman and learn about, it, it prompted them to want to understand what was going on in this other part of the world. And it was a way for people who aren't necessarily international development types or don't have a connection to Uganda to understand where this place is, why it's significant, and why they should care. 
And so it was a way to kind of make the connection between the producer and the consumer. And so one of our goals with One Mango Tree is to make that relationship as transparent as possible. And so in the bottom left corner, you can see our tags. The women who make the products actually sign the tags. So Anena Nasserin, who also does, she's in charge of all of our cutting for all of our patterns. So in the picture there, she's cutting one of the patterns for, I believe that's one of our market totes, one of our larger bags. But this is a tag where she signed her name. That was from one of the products I had at my house. So when you go on our website, when you get a One Mango Tree product, you can see the woman's name and you can go on the website and their names are all there. Um, we're working on developing the stories. So we're doing interviews with each woman, what they want to tell, you know, if they're, you know, taking that exchange, if someone was coming up to them in Gulu and buying a bag and getting to know them, just like so many people go into Mama Lucy's shop and buy things from her. And we wanted to cre recreate that interaction. And so, you know, we're adding videos, we're doing the stories that the women want to tell themselves. So these are just 21 of our ladies. We have about 40 working for us full time. I couldn't fit them all on one slide. <laughs> so this is just a sampling of the women that work with us in Uganda. So the third fair trade principle is to build capacity. So not just going there and buying from a group of producers, but also giving back. So that's a big, that's really a big push for us. So one of the things we recently started doing is we realized that after being in conflict for more than 20 years, most people just were so grateful to have some money that they didn't even think about saving it. And so they were getting their, their monthly payments and then they were just spending it immediately and they weren't keeping track of it at all. And so a couple of our ladies started setting goals and were doing this on their own. So we decided, let's give them another opportunity to really come together as a group and learn how to save. And so we recently established a Village Savings and Loan Association, which is this box in the picture. The women actually come in and each month they give part of their earnings in cash, goes into the box. They have a little book like that Respond Renew. That's actually another organization that we partnered with that provides training. So in addition to savings, every week they have a two hour training. It's actually twice a week, one hour a day about financial literacy teaching them how to create a budget for their families, how to save money and set goals. Um, one of our ladies is gonna be putting a roof on a house this Christmas, which is a really big deal. She saved about a million shillings over the last year, which is about $500, which is really huge. Um, so that's, it's really exciting to be able to offer that. We're also starting English literacy courses, as well as Acholi literacy, because so many of our women, Acholi is the local language, but they can't even read an Acholi. So we're starting those types of courses. And then on the right is one of our ladies. We just did a program with International Organization for Migration. And so, I, as I said, one of the reasons I went to Northern Uganda was to learn about the conflict and conflict resolution. And so one of the roles that we play is by bringing everyone together in a workplace, there's a reintegration aspect of it. And so there's women from all different communities in Northern Uganda. This woman here in the photo actually was a former combatant during the war. She was abducted by the rebels. So we recently took on nine new ladies that were all either child mothers or formerly abducted when they were children and are now adults, but they were st totally stigmatized from their communities and really did not have a support network. And it definitely, it took some time to kind of bring them into the fold, but now they've been with us for about six months, and you're really starting to see their kids come to our daycare, they're playing with the other kids, the women all support each other, they all sit together and have lunch, they, you know, it's really, it becomes a support network and brings them, so maybe while they aren't necessarily being accepted into the community where they came from, they have a new community that can support them. So that's really another important part of what we do. So building capacity, not just from sewing, even though they're, they're brilliant, they're getting so much better at sewing, it's unbelievable, but also building capacity for themselves in their own lives and to improve the quality of their lives. Number four is to promote fair trade, which is exactly what I'm doing right now. So that's part of One Mango Tree's mission is to educate consumers as well. So while the, the women, all of the ladies I work with in Gulu have gone through training and understand what fair trade means and what it means to them, now my mission is to be back in the United States and telling everyone here, it really works. It really makes a difference.
So we are members of Fair Trade Federation, which is not, it's more like a, a mem it's not a certifying body, but I, we wrote like a 50 page application to become members of this. So they, they hold you accountable and really you have to follow these principles very closely in your business to be a member. So this is actually at the Ohio Fair Trade Expo. And that's my mom. She is our business manager. So whenever anyone orders from our online retail site, my mom is packing everything really nicely. And she always writes little handwritten notes. She absolutely loves her job. It's amazing. And it's so wonderful. It's become a family business to share this. So she, was, she went with me. I'm, this was in Cleveland to promote fair trade. So number five, really, really important, pay promptly and fairly. So this is Prisca and Claire. Claire has the book in her lap. So the way we do labor payments is Prisca actually, at the end of each day, the lady will bring over her bundle of market totes. And they'll write down, Prisca will go through all the quality control, write down, and they get paid per piece on how much they're making. And so the women have the major book they keep it in, they also keep track of it in their own book. And then Prisca puts this all in a spreadsheet and emails it to me. We've opened bank accounts at Barclays for each woman that works for us. So I actually go each month and pay them directly. You can't really get any more transparent than that. Um, I had so many problems at first that I would give someone money and expect them to pay people and the money would disappear. And so I love that technology allows us to be able to have that kind of direct relationship with the producers so that I'm buying the products directly from them. Number six is to support empowering work conditions. So I think this one kind of goes along with building capacity because it really is, there's such a huge change. And the women that we work with from when they first start on board with us, even within a couple of months, they're going and getting their hair and nails done. I think women all over the world, as soon as they make a little money. <laughs> you know, it's a, sending the kids to school first is the most important thing, and then I'm going to get my hair done. <laughs> and you can just, I mean, it's really an amazing thing to be in Uganda and to see these women grow. We did portraits when we first started working with some women that were from the camps. And after six months of working with us, they look like a completely different person. And I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's different. You know, they're becoming vocal. They are becoming leaders, both within the workshop and going back in their own communities. Um, this is Eunice. Um, she's actually a model on our website. If you see, she modeled some of our organic cotton apparel as well. Um, but she was just voted as employee of the month this past month, which is an extra bonus. The women all vote on who should win, and then the employee of the month gets an extra bonus and a certificate. So they all kind of, you know, they're competing on who's the most efficient, who does the highest quality, you know, the least amount of errors in their work, but also who's supportive um, and who's, who's really going out of their way not for the business, but for the community and for the other women that they work with. And so Eunice won this month. And the other picture there is actually the women keep their own chart of what's being produced. And so they're always working towards a goal for our orders of how many bags they have to produce. So we put the fabric up there and then they actually chalk it up. When they finish a bag, they take it up on the chalkboard and they write it. So it's such a huge, we'll do 20,000 handbags in a season. So you can imagine they get so excited to work towards that goal. One of my favorite, ensuring, ensuring children's rights. Um, when we start, first started working with these ladies, they, they tie their babies on their backs, kind of like Maria's mom is doing with her teddy bear in the bottom picture. Um, but we had about 10 women who gave birth in the course of the last year, and they were bringing their babies and sitting at the sewing machines. We give them maternity leave. They have three months paid maternity leave. Hardly any of them want to use it because they want to come, even though they make the same, it, it doesn't make sense to me, but they want, I think they miss their community and they want to come back. But finally what we decided to do, which was prompted actually by my parents coming to visit Uganda this summer for the first time, is we needed a daycare. So we, the picture in the upper right hand corner here is the daycare room that we put together and we hired a teacher. Um, and just as I predicted, after three days of the daycare being open, we went from nine children to 17 children enrolled. Um, so we're now trying to get another teacher. <laughs> she was instantly overwhelmed. Um, but these are for infants and toddlers, our daycares for infants and toddlers, because we provide school fees for the rest of the kids. So another thing, profits from the sale of the products, 
these women take care of not only their own children, but because of the war in northern Uganda, there are so many orphans. So on average, each woman that we work with takes care of four or five either children of siblings who had passed away or orphan is a, is a different kind of term in northern Uganda. The parent might be around, but they're somewhere else working or they're in the fields or there's not a school nearby. Um, but these women, as soon as they get jobs, they end up having all this responsibility because all these other children end up showing up, whether it's family or friends, that they end up taking care of. So to help ease the burden on that, because school fees are so expensive, we provide stipends. And we do that through our profits, but also through donations on our website. So that is, we, we put a lot of focus on the children, because that's another part of it is that if the, if the children are provided for, we're growing a new generation of you know, their parents were not educated. The majority of the women I work with are not literate, don't speak English, but their children are all going to school. And that is where you can really start to see real change happening. So number eight, um, this is something that the ladies in Uganda don't really catch on to that much yet, but cultivating environmental stewardship. It's another fair trade principle. And here in the United States, I think we get it a lot more with the green movement really picking up and organic. And it's something that I personally have been really committed to and interested in. And I, some people would say I'm a little obsessed, but I'm trying to source African fabrics. I don't want, I want our products to be made in Africa from seed to sown, from the entire supply chain, which has been a really big challenge. But this year, actually, we achieved it. So I was buying fabrics from the local markets, and then I found out they were all made in China. In Uganda, about 95% of those beautiful African fabrics are actually Chinese imports. And they're only sold in, in small pieces. It's almost impossible to buy bulk unless you buy direct from China. And I thought, that doesn't make sense. You know, research, research the history of Kitenge and wax print in Africa, and it's incredible. Uh, but nobody's really making it in East Africa anymore. There's only a couple of places, and the quality is really poor. So what we decided to do this year is to go organic and also go with an African manufacturer. And so this fabric actually is 100% organic cotton. The cotton was grown in northern Uganda. The fabric was made in Uganda. And then it, the, the bag was manufactured. So it has a little bit of a different look, but we still kept popular African motifs for the fabric to still kind of have that feel, but then to achieve an African fabric as well as an African product. And so the picture on the left shows another one of our fabrics. This is actually at the factory in Jinja where we source our fabric watching it being made. And then Konsi is modeling one of our organic cotton knit shirts. Um, we just started working, and I'm wearing our dress today, so um, I found a great source for organic cotton knit. Again, it's grown in northern Uganda. It's providing jobs for farmers there, good jobs. Um, organic cotton farmers in Uganda usually make about double what a conventional farmer. And, at this point, pretty much all of the production of organic co of cotton in northern Uganda has been converted to organic because there's so much demand for it, which is fantastic. So we're making a lot of women's apparel right now. Next year, we're going to start getting into men's t-shirts and polo shirts and things like that. We also put a lot of focus on natural materials because some of the craft that was originally done in northern Uganda was a lot of basket weaving. So this purse that we just did, it's a, it's a clutch bag called the Betty that's in the bottom right hand corner, called the Betty because Anena Betty's son, whose name is Obama, is obsessed with eating bananas. So it's a roundabout way of getting there. But So we decided to name the purse the Betty. Um, but that's actually made from woven banana leaves. So we took a traditional technique that women were already doing, collecting banana leaves from their villages, and then turned it into a really cute little clutch purse. And then my business card I put up there because we do all of our printing. We do it here in the United States, but we work with all tree-free paper and soy-based ink. I have a bunch of business cards here I can pass out afterwards, but our business cards are actually made from mango. So it's all the fibers and seeds left over from mango that's all ground down and then turned into a paper. So our last point, and one of the most important, is respecting cultural identity. And so the images here are of a traditional, this actually is from one of the camps, but it gives you a sense of the traditional housing that most of the women live in, the mud, mud walled thatched roof homes in Northern Uganda. <clears throat> and then the three ladies on the right, um, Josephine, Claire, and Pamela are 
best, best friends. And they actually did a photo shoot for a book that might have them on the cover of it that's coming out. But this is their traditional wear. So part of respecting the cultural identity, I mean, there's a certain extent to which culture in the Acholi culture in northern Uganda has been completely destroyed because of the war. And so for this point, for us, what I feel is really important is just building the social fabric back. Um, northern Uganda was an agricultural area. It was the breadbasket of the region. And helping people to be able to have livelihoods and to be able to support their families, I feel, is doing a piece to bring it back together. Um, getting people to talk to each other that weren't talking to each other before. So that reconciliation and reintegration part of it is, is part of how we pay respect to cultural identity in northern Uganda. And I just wanted to put some pictures up so you can see the end results of our products. Um, we have a lunch bag in the upper left corner, and then our skirt um, is in our organic knit, and also the tank tops that are hanging up there. Uh, the sandals in the upper right-hand corner, we partnered with another organization called SACO, and it's a program for young women who finished secondary school, and they sew these sandal straps, and they earn money for university. Uh, and there's programming. SACO is an awesome organization. I'm really excited to be able to partner with them. So what we do is we make the SACO sandal straps in our fabrics so that they match the bags, and we sell them on our website to help promote and give back to those university scholarships. Um, and then actually on the bottom, these bottom two, the necklace, that's another group of women that make jewelry out of natural seeds that they collect, again, like the banana leaves. It's the same group, and they make their own jewelry. They do their own designs. Um, but another group in northern Uganda that we decided to reach out and support. And the scarves, like the one I have on today, is another group um, that I just recently found. I was delighted. They're really talented weavers. And so they've been do using cotton yarns and making beautiful, beautiful scarves. So we just got those in for fall and winter of this year. So that is all I have for you for a presentation. But if anyone has questions, we still have time. And I'm glad. Yes. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. That is very inspiring. Thanks. <laughs> I want to ask you something technical. Mm -hmm. uh, these materials, how do they print the, the, you know, the, the Oh, like these ones? Yes. And the scarf as well. Yeah. You know, from what is the, from what are the colors that are used to make those mm -hmm. materials? So for these prints, they're using, it's almost like screen printing for a t-shirt, but it's an industrial method. So it's called rotary screen printing. And actually, if you go on our blog, there's a really nice photo story of how it's done, but it's basically like um, a, it's a screen that's made that only allows certain colors or certain parts of the pattern to come through, but they roll it on a, on a big roll and then the ink comes through that roll. So they'll roll one color first and then the next color. Um, and they're using low impact dyes. So that's how they do the printing for these. Um, prior to using that process, we were working with a workshop that did it by hand that would be just like printing a t-shirt, but not block printing, it's still screen printing where they're taking a big screen and they're putting ink in it and then pushing it over just like you would do a traditional like for a t-shirt. Um, but we had a lot of quality issues with that. And so we kind of had to go with the industrial process for it. For the scarves, this was really amazing. This group was doing a lot of just striped scarves and you can see it has so much color variation I just love it. And it kind of reminds me of ECOT, which I think is on, there's a museum, the textile museum has an exhibit right now, which is from Uzbekistan. Um, but basically, I was so impressed. They, they hand dye the yarns, so they tie dye them. They actually take a big bundle of the, of the cotton yarn and they tie dye it with all these different beautiful colors. Then they put that onto the loom and then the yarn that they're pulling across is green. So for all of our scarves, we have five different colors. Um, it completely changes just based on the color that they're weaving across the same dot, the tie-dye yarn. So this one's green, we did another one with blue that's really beautiful. And so it comes out as purple. And we did red, which um, the last picture. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. So the one, <laughs> you can see the, the one that looks red there, um, brownish, that was with a red yarn. So, and I just, I love this. We're actually gonna start making bags and buying this fabric. It's handmade, it's hand loomed. Um, and so one of the things we're thinking about doing next year is working with natural dyes, um, but using these fabrics for our bags as well because they're just so beautiful and unique. Yes. Manu yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. We'll stu the, the manufacturing will be in Uganda because the mission, our, One Mango Tree's mission is to create jobs for men and women in, in areas that are emerging from conflict. So the underlying, the theory behind what we're doing is that if you give someone a job, if they have money coming in, they have something to work for, they're much less likely to participate in violent conflict. And so going along with that, if you go into, I mean really, I personally feel that if, if private business would go into areas that are emerging from conflict and invest and create jobs for people, that's the strongest thing that can be done to prevent future conflict from arising. So I'm doing that on a really tiny scale, but it's still something, so. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, that's a really good question. So at first, it was just based on a relationship. I met Lucy in the market, and it was just one of those things where kind of in your gut, you know you found the right person. But what I, when I first started working with her, she kind of had a natural tendency to, because she kind of, everyone calls her Mama Lucy. And so people would bring in young women who had gotten pregnant and were out on the street and had nowhere to go. and. Lucy had been in that situation herself, so now she had a little a small business going, so she was kind of bringing those women in on her own and selecting them on her own. Then we ended up, we wanted to be able to reach women who were vulnerable but had also received tailoring training. So we did two waves. The first one, we worked with a local NGO that helped identify women for us um, in two of the camps. Um, so. At first, we were working in three locations, and then we ended up bringing all of those women together after the training. We now have one workshop. Everyone works under the same roof. But now, moving forward, what we've done is we've actually partnered with International Organization for Migration. They did a brilliant labor study of the entire region and have a database, basically, of skills of individuals in all of these communities. And so anytime I need a new employee, I actually just go to IOM and I say, we're gonna do a training. I need to know women who've received sewing training but are not working right now. Because that's, again, that brings in these groups and it also contributes to this community reintegration that we're trying to do. So that's how we, now, so that's for our tailoring program. The other groups, uh, what I've been trying to do is because we have access and because One Mango Tree's been successful in selling on our website and selling wholesale, <laughs> I love to give other artists and groups access that are already established. So those, it's just finding people that have talent and have a, an interesting product, and then I help them make the connection. <laughs> Exporting is kind of a nightmare, but we now have it down to a science, and it's really, really, I mean, that's a huge block for most of these, or, these cooperatives and organizations. So we can help them get the products to the United States and put them in touch with the right retailers. So. Yes? Um. I'm wondering, I'm very interested in giving back, and I'm wondering if, if you've considered any type of um, design research along the lines of having some of the women go to those who are aware of cultural designs, mm -hmm. methods, fabrics, materials, all of that, and creating some type of documented history, whether it's yeah. oral or images, and whether it's used for your business or just for education. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something you're already doing? Um, it's not. It's something we've participated in a little bit with. There's an organization there called the Acholi Private Sector Development Corporation, and it's part of the Export Promotion Board. And what they've been doing is actually going, they've received funding, I think, from the EU, and they go around northern, actually all over the country. And what they're trying to do is identify artisan craft. 
So I've been, I'm actually looking forward to reading. They're putting together a paper. They're essentially doing exactly what you just mentioned. And they came and talked to us and, you know, we were one, basically what we talked about was using the fabrics in the market and the traditional African dresses and those fabrics and that sort of thing. Um, one of the really unfortunate things though is I think because of the persistence of conflict in Northern Uganda, there's very, very little craft in the whole country actually. Um, I was just in Kenya last month and I couldn't believe when I went to Kenya's markets, I had a big realization that the craft markets in Uganda are basically just imported products from Kenya. Um, all of the Maasai jewelry and all that. So aside from baskets and some different clay things, um, there's, there's not a whole lot, but they are trying to document it and put it all together. Yeah. They're 100% cotton, so, and they're color fast. So I always recommend to people not to put them in the washer. Um, you know, the best thing is obviously to hand wash them, but they're totally washable. Yeah. Um, do you partner with uh, 10,000 villages? You know, the organization yeah, that yeah. brings in uh, crafts from um, a lot of developing because uh, they have a lot of distributors as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. We actually... Similar to 10,000 Villages, I, I know them very well, but um, we have a, a contract with a company called Global Girlfriends, and they specifically work with women organizations. And so they, the, the whole, I really got into learning the business side of this, which is just crazy, but they're a wholesaler. So when we signed on with them, it took our business to a completely new level. Um, this year we were on Target.com, for their very first, Target doesn't have fair trade in their stores yet, but they're experimenting with it on their website, which I think is a step in the right direction. So they had, actually our black and white print was on Target.com this last season, and in Whole Foods grocery stores. Um, but they have something like 1,700 retailers. So I just went to the Fair Trade Futures Conference in Boston, and it was so amazing to go there, because I haven't been in the US for two years, I've been in Uganda, and I had all of these shop owners, brick and mortar store owners, from all over the country that were coming up and they're like, we love one mango tree, we carry your stuff in our stores, we have your oven mitts, we have this. And so what's really great about, you know, one of the things, again, about technology, being able to be a small business and, and be the conduit for getting these crafts into a much larger market. Um, so signing on with them, similar to 10,000 Villages, but I think that their market is even bigger because they are marketing to people like Target and Whole Foods. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even for fair trade, the, the fair trade market in Europe is, is probably 10 years ahead of where we are here in the U.S. Um, I am hoping if I have enough capital to get over to Europe and to do some trade shows and to go and kind of find out who the bigger players are, for, like who's the 10,000 villages in Europe, for instance. Um, to be able to make those connections. I know we'll be able to get into that market. I have had a lot of interest from Australia as well. So, but we're just kind of peaking. We haven't, we're a young company. I didn't start the business until the end of 2007. And all of 2008, I was still living in DC, you know, walking to the post office with a whole bunch of boxes and like <laughs> totally losing my mind. And my boss was getting really irritated with me at my job. Um, but so one of the things I've realized is just to kind of step back and enjoy where we are and really do it well um, because we get really eager to take on more and to create more jobs but if we're not ready for it, if we can't meet the deadlines and the production with the quality that we need. So, but Europe and the rest of the world are definitely, I want to sell in Uganda too by the way. Um, I get so, there's so much demand, Eve was saying there's a fantastic little shop there called Banana Boat that everyone shops at. It's not just, I mean, it's Ugandans and it's expats. Everybody goes there to buy craft and it's the only shop. I mean, other than that, there's the, the regular market, um, but unfortunately a lot of those crafts are not being sold in a fair trade manner. And so to be able to actually sell one mango tree products in Uganda is one of my dreams. So hopefully one day we'll be doing that as well. Did you make the belt you wear? No, it's from, it's from a store. I, <laughs> I wish. It has a giraffe on it somewhere, so. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. What, what were you doing in Pakistan? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah, so what's really funny is that when none of the, I was trying to get a job with these contractors that work with USAID, and when I first, before I had started One Mango Tree, none of them would touch me with a 10-foot pole because I hadn't done the Peace Corps. So then I, I dove in head first, and there's no better way to learn about everything in a country from the politics to, you know, trying to get things done, the culture, all of it, than starting a business. Um, you know, I look back on it now, and I think I was a little bit crazy, naive, but, you know. Um, so what's been great about that is through the contacts of working, I've, I've done some consulting in northern Uganda related to conflict and related to livelihood activities and things like that, because you learn a lot about just value chains in general, whether it's agriculture or it's crafts, you really learn how to make things work and where there's gaps. So I met a woman who was doing some work in Nairobi on craft projects who had been asked to go to Pakistan and was terrified. And I was like, I'm not terrified. They have mangoes there and they have a lot of conflict issues. I want to go. How, on, you know, how else am I going to be able to go to Pakistan if I don't go and do something like this? And it was like a, you know, it was as if the terms of reference were written specifically for what I do. It was the most rewarding, wonderful experience. I spent about four months there this year working with about 25 women-owned businesses all over the country doing embellished garments, crafts, jewelry, shoes, you name it, handbags, um, helping them. And they were, they're the, you know, so they're the entrepreneurs working with the artisans in Pakistan. And there are just so many incredible artisans in Pakistan. So really helping them to develop their products so that they can start exporting them. Because there's not a lot of craft out there from Pakistan right now. And there's a lot of stigma against even buying, you know, a Pakistani product. So that was, we did a, we did an exhibition. I organized a buyer trip. I took about 14 yeah, 14 fair trade wholesalers to Pakistan to introduce them to the country and to these business owners and to learn about. But it's the same kind of concept, again, economic activities to hopefully engage people in work so that they will not take part in violence. Are there any other questions? We can take one more question if anyone has any questions. Well, I know. Um, I think I made a good contribution to uh, a Ugandan girl going to school, and I'm looking forward to getting back on the website, and um, I know Christmas is coming. Um, so... Uh, oh, yeah, I just, I wanted to tell you all, I live in Logan Circle, and one of the things I really enjoy about being back in Washington is bringing people together that share interests, that are interested in Africa, that are interested in artisan crafts, um, and that are interested in meeting other people that have the same interests. And so normally I have um, an email list, and every year before I moved, I always had a big party at my house for the holidays to just have everybody over, eat food, see products, look at photos, listen to great music, all that sort of thing. So I think at the desk we have, yeah. a, we have a sheet. If you want to leave your email address, you're all more than welcome to come. I'll send you the information about it. So please do sign up if that sounds like something that would be interesting to you. I'd love to have you. Now the question is, can she make matoki? <laughs> yeah, I can. I don't think we can get the right bananas. That's mashed bananas, mashed green bananas. Uganda national dish. Kind of like potatoes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I am just completely impressed by one mango tree. I love the stuff. I got a little note from her mother, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it really makes you feel like, you know, wow, somebody actually cares who put together this package. And I had a little lanyap in there, you know, Jamaicans call it brata, a little extra something that was in there. And I was like, wow, this Oh, she keeps giving away products as gifts. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. Customers love it, though. Yeah, <laughs> it was really great. And um, I love the website. I, I'm going to out her and Alicia Bartlett, put it on her Facebook page. And... She knows everything, and I'm so glad that we were able to connect with Holly, and it's just really impressive to know that somebody so young, you know, uh, has done so much work, and it will make a big difference in northern Uganda because they suffered there for a very long time. Um, anybody who's seen the movie War Dance or Children, Children of War yeah. um, knows that northern Uganda went through a really hard time, um, and this is just fantastic to 
help people, you know, put their lives back together. And, you know, you get some great stuff uh, in the interim. So please, you know, let's thank Holly for coming and speaking today. And I hope you all will sign up at the at the on the email sheet and that yeah. If anyone be... wants my contact information, I do have those mango business cards. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat them, please. <laughs> I'm definitely taking one. Yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.